Anna. My name is Shakela Alboranga. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Mob Museum. Thank you to those who were able to join us in person. And this is also being live streamed on Facebook and um, on our website as well. So thank you to those who are watching online too. So today's Science of Crime program is about um, the 21st century in forensic science, and we have a very special presentation today with Scott and Sarah Lausenheiser, as well as one of their students who will be talking about a special project that they've been working on um, over the past few months. So with that being said, I'll give them a round of applause. career in Technical Academy. Um, my wife, Sarah, will explain a little bit more of that in a minute, but I'm also a part-time corner investigator for the Clark County Coroner's Office. So I've been teaching for about 10 years, and I've been an investigator over the office for about 15 years. And um, I'd like to also introduce Maddie. Go ahead, Maddie. The, veterans, uh, the Forensic Science Program at Veterans Tribute, and I'm going to be going to UNR next year for biology. Cool. So I am Sarah Lotzenheiser, as you can tell from our last name. We are married. Um, we l work together. We teach together. Um, we live together. We raise children and dogs together. Um, and so uh, as both of the forensic science teachers at Veterans Tribute, um, our job is basically to prepare students like Maddie upon graduation to go into the field of forensic science. And so before we talk about um, that specific aspect, I just want to tell you a little bit about our school. So there's a poster right here. You can see it's a uh, kind of highlights uh, some of the programs at our school. And so we are a public school. It's called Veterans Tribute Career and Technical Academy, um, a CCSD public school. Um, and we're called a CTA, or a Career and Technical Academy. And you may have heard of them. There's lots of them around the valley. But basically, the idea of CTAs is you expose students to various program areas and kind of give them a head start in that um, career field before they would graduate from high school. So our CTA offers these six program areas, and you can see they all fall under the umbrella of public safety. So part of our job as forensic science educators is not only give our students like content knowledge, right, and to teach them about DNA analysis, but then to have them have the opportunity to see what it's like in the real world. And so to do that, we really need to partner with community members. And so one of our partners is the Mom Museum. We have students who volunteer at the Mom Museum. We have students who have internships at the coroner's office. We have students who have mentors from um, the LVMPD uh, crime lab. And so the idea is not only is it what happens in the classroom, but it's about uh, giving the students the exposure to what really a collaborative or multifaceted approach, and that's what the forensic science world really is. And so we have graduates who work at the coroner's office, who work at LVMPD Forensics Lab, who are crime scene investigators. And so it's important for us to not only give them that content knowledge, but help them kind of see how it plays out in the real world. So we felt like the best way to explain that to our audience was to give them a real world project that we did this past year, actually Scott mostly did, with a group of seniors, even under quarantine circumstances, um, these students got the opportunity uh, to go to the coroner's office and to help try to identify Jane and John Doe's. And so that's what Scott's going to talk about for um, pretty much most of the presentation. And if there's any questions at the end, either online or in person about our school, um, I'll be happy to answer them. All right. So uh, this um, project, again, um, it's, it's been ongoing at the coroner's offices. Um, we, part of the job of the coroner's office is to identify decedents. And there are times when um, we are not able to through traditional means, and so they become John or Jane Doe's. And so over time, our office and every other major office across the country um, has John and Jane Doe cases that just kind of collect over the years. And so we wanted to kind of put fresh eyes on it again. I can tell you I'm not the first one to do this. Um, there's lots of other people over the years that have you know, uh, tried to attack these to try to bring life back to them to get them identified so their families can um, figure out who they are. So first, I'll, um, again, thank you for being here. We'll watch a quick um, four and a half minute video just to kind of show kind of what the purpose of this is. Oh, 
Thank you. It has been more than 25 years since a young mother was last seen here in Vegas, and her daughter is still searching for her as if it were yesterday. Time has erased many clues as to what may have happened to Camille Dardane's Dotson, but it is not stopping her daughter Ashley in her quest for answers. And thanks to an internet crusader Ashley encountered along the way, this case has gone viral. Details, pictures, and even podcasts shared thousands of times. And I've thought of her begging for her life, her on her knees crying. It, it keeps me up some nights. Ashley Dodson has lived most of her life wondering what happened to her mom, Camille Dardanes Dodson. She grew up in Chicago, a straight A student and semi-pro ice skater. She was by all accounts a vivacious, captivating young woman, but someone who could not escape her troubles. Today, most people aware of her case believe Camille is dead, but at whose hand? The estranged husband, the new guy she was staying with, an obsessed regular at the strip club she worked at that was owned by a mobster, or maybe even a total stranger. Like, she's a human and she deserves justice, and if the police aren't gonna get it, somebody has to. Stay-at-home mom Gabby Prolu is doing everything she can to bring heat to this long, cold case. After reading about Camille on a missing persons page two years ago, We've been emailing every podcast we can find. I've been contacting every YouTuber. Um, before this, there was nothing. Camille was once the center of the news world, appearing on Good Morning America in 1985. After I met Gary, there was never any doubt. Her marriage to Gary Dotson made national headlines. 21-year-old Camille was captivated with Gary an infamous convicted rapist whose accuser recanted her story after he spent six years in prison. His clemency hearing was open to the public, and though she never met him, Camille approached him at that hearing, and they started dating after his release. The love and marriage did not last. Camille moved to Vegas, where her mother lived, to get herself and Ashley away from Gary after he was arrested for beating her. The single mom with no higher education and no real job history worked a string of bar and diner jobs, eventually dancing at the Crazy Horse Strip Club and Crazy Horse 2. Strip clubs owned by mob member Tony Albanese. Ashley's grandma moved her back to Chicago when Camille got caught in a downward spiral, marrying another abusive husband, becoming addicted to drugs, and eventually turning to prostitution. We you know she was arrested on September 3rd, um, 1994. She was released the next day at around 4 p.m. Never seen again. As Camille's case has been thrust into the spotlight online, Ashley and Gabby have found former friends and co-workers who provided details like where she lived, stayed, worked, and spent time. The last man she lived with cannot be found. There's actually a warrant out for him right now, so we haven't been able to contact him or get into touch with him at all. Ashley says no matter what happened to her mom, even if she met a gruesome end, knowing will help give her closure. I think it would help heal that part of my heart that just holds out that hope. Ashley says through investigating the disappearance of her mom, she's found true family. She now considers Gabby a sister. They work on the case together every day and don't plan on stopping until they uncover what happened in Vegas to Camille Dardane's Dotson. However long it takes, it's worth it because that's a human being out there, and she's a daughter and a mother and a sister, and people loved her, and, she, you know, she deserves justice, and Ashley deserves answers. It's, it's just, it comes down to that. And Fox 5 reached out to Metro asking to speak to the detective now overseeing this case. Though it's been 25 years, a police spokesperson tells us that they do not comment on open investigations. So uh, that is one of many cases I think I just want to highlight that there is lots of family members that are missing their loved ones and friends that are missing loved ones that have this kind of hanging over them for a long time. Um, and it's a, it's a huge deal for them to have that loss and not knowing. And so um, from the coroner's office perspective is we want to um, assist in making sure that we can provide resolution 
and get um, some sort of closure for as many of these people as possible. And that's just one, like I said, of many, many cases. I mean, we are Clark County, which is Las Vegas, Nevada, and so we have a lot of people that come in and out of this community. Um, lots of times they've left their you know, homes and for various reasons are kind of trying to start up fresh here in Las Vegas, and sometimes things happen to them. And so um, there's other cases, Stephen Kocher, there's, if you just follow the news, there's kind of cases after cases that a lot of times we just don't know what happened to these people. And so that's on one side. And then on the other side, the Clark County Coroner's Office gets individuals who are deceased and we are not able to identify all of them all of the time. And so if we can identify them tr through traditional means, like I said before, they end up being John and Jane Doe's. And so this is what the goal of this project was, is to try to um, get resolution um, and close as many of our cases at the coroner's office as possible to help reconnect them with their family members. And so it's that whole kind of humanitarian um, part of it that I think is extremely important for us to do. And um, if you were local and saw the news, I mean, we had a seven-year-old boy that was found in um, the mountains, murdered, and he remained a doe um, for quite some time before he was able to be identified. And so making those connections is extremely important, not just for the family, but also to um, resolve criminal cases as well. So this is the problem, is um, we live in the United States and we are just a conglomerate of law enforcement agencies, coroner's offices, medical examiners. Most are county run, some are state run, but as you travel across the United States, um, it's just a hodgepodge of different agencies that all have their own caseloads. And for a long time, these agencies did not communicate with each other. And so if you, if you crossed you know, uh, invisible boundaries, you're in a brand new jurisdiction and a lot of times there's unknown uh, uh, communication between the two. So the NCIC, which is the Law Enforcement Computer Database, um, in 1975 started a missing persons kind of database set. So law enforcement agency can upload uh, missing people into this. And then um, also in 1983, they added an unidentified persons component to the NCIC system. This was largely just a law enforcement database. And so the most recent records from NCIC is from 2020. And in 2020, over 540,000 missing people were um, input into this database, 540,000. Of those, uh, 60,000, over 60,000 did not get resolved, so remain missing persons cases. Um, later, uh, there's also the unidentified um, part of this system and they had 8,000 unidentified individuals put into NCIC and 800 of those remained unresolved and this is year after year. So as you can imagine in the United States this is this is a big thing and again we kind of um, we have this um, problem of making these identifications and how do we keep interest and, and keep the investigations going. And so the Clark County Coroner's Office, as early as 2003, tried to attack this problem as well. And so we started, um, this was previous to me, um, other good investigators started a website where we put our unidentified John and Jane Doe's and pictures of them on a website so that family members could look at the people that we have to see if it's their loved one or not. This got a little bit of criticism at first because we're putting dead people on the internet, which you know kind of uh, upset some people. But then we started solving cases, and I think that solving cases definitely trumped over the you know the kind of the the the, dis the distaste of putting deceased individuals' photos. Um, so once we started getting success, L Los Angeles County Coroner's Office did the same thing. San Bernardino, other um, coroner's offices across the country did similar things. The problem is the family members would have to go hopscotch around all these websites and continue to check in. And so um, we have been trying to solve this problem to the best of our ability um, for quite some time, even before I got involved at the office. Um, in about 10 years ago, we also got a great opportunity to um, do some exhumations. We got a, a grant, and so we exhumed a bunch of our John and Jane Doe's, and we re-autopsied them, redid odontology, redid anthropology, and even pulled some DNA to enter it into CODIS to see if they were in CODIS, which is the national database for DNA. And then we reinterred them. And so again, that was about 10 years ago. Uh, also, um, more recently, in 2007, with uh, collaboration with the, between the NIJ and um, another agency, is they created NamUs. Which, so now we have a federal website, a federally funded and run website, where law enforcement agencies can put in 
missing people and also coroner's offices across the country can put in their unidentified people and then the the database the website will try to correlate these and inform the agencies but it provides a clearinghouse where everybody can look in one spot and so this has been a great um, resource for everybody in the United States concerning missing people and unidentified people um, and so this is not a knock to name us at all, but um, it's almost uh, too successful. There's a lot of entries into NamUs now from across the country. And so when you go into NamUs and you do some searches, this is kind of what it looks like. And so on the left is the unidentified person's number that NamUs assigns. There's our coroner's office case numbers, and then uh, age ranges and where they're found. And so this, um, like I said, is a great resource, but almost has a little too much in there sometimes for uh, the user side of it. So the idea was to let's try to attack our John and Jane Doe's at the Clark County Coroner's Office using our wonderful students at Veterans Tribute, um, also free labor, right? And so um, it's great exposure for them. Um, this was during the pandemic, so we had to wait until we could be authorized to kind of be in the same rooms together, um, wearing masks and all this stuff. But we got um, approval from, at the time, the interim coroner, Mike Murphy, um, and we set up the goals of to go through all of our John and Jane Doe cases back into the 70s to current and, and kind of um, figure what information each of them have is there anything that can potentially identify these people in these records and then we want to pull those ones out that have more or higher potential and have a way to kind of highlight them so that they can be pushed out in different places and then we can also find out which ones have less probability of identification I'll try to show you kind of some of those issues before um, and later in this show so these are high school students in Las Vegas and so um, we have to do confidentiality we have to get parents on board so thank you to all the parents of these students for allowing them to work at the coroner's office and then again we had to uh, have the coroner's office get on board with um, students come in and go through these case files um, that have sometimes gruesome and decomposing pictures and dismemberments in them and so that was kind of one of the first obstacles just getting this whole thing um, started but we did and we have this elite team of forensic science students um, that are all seniors or are now graduated um, and we brought them to the coroner's office and we started the task of going through the cases and so we did queries and we found out that there's about 270 John and Jane Doe's currently um, listed at the coroner's office we don't ha retain them anymore they're in various you know mortuaries across the valley but uh, that's about the number we're dealing with and so um, some of them are new computerized in recent years but we also have old manila envelopes and case files and pictures from you know kind of the pre-internet computer days and so here's the students kind of uh, starting to open up some of those cases and sift through the files go through the odontology records go through the photos through the anthropology reports, go through all the case notes to see if there's anything that would lend this case to be one of the ones that we could um, hopefully get identified. And as we um, went through them, again, here are some of the case files and students going through them. Um, it, we spent several Saturdays, several school days. I mean, this was definitely hours of um, students' work. And as you can see, not all does are created equally from the coroner's office. Some of these are just bone fragments or a single bone that's found in the desert. And other ones are entire human remains that just didn't have identification on them and their fingerprints didn't pop in any databases. And so they've remained um, unidentified. One of the people that um, we have was a female, Caucasian female, found next to a bus stop in Las Vegas. And she had Linda handwritten on her clothes, her shoes, her pants. I mean, she's Linda, but we never were able to get her identified. And so she's remained a Jane Doe at her office since that time. Other ones are skeletal remains or any process or any um, part stage of decomposition in between that. So we kind of had to sift through these records to see what information we had and what was going to be useful. And we made a spreadsheet. And so um, we listed our 273 John and Jane Does and tried to color code them. So the greens were the ones that had information that we thought would be beneficial in getting these people identified. And then the yellow were like not something visually, but might, maybe some anthropological information information or something that somebody might be able to attach to and then the red ones are kind of like not yet not right now with our 
technology. And then even some of these gray ones, um, the 273 DOE cases, not all of them are going to get identified because some of these are not forensic interest cases. They, they got um, input into our office, but um, it could be, as you see, a non-human tongue. Um, some of these are fetuses. Some of these are non-human. Some of them are, you know, old, um, like, anatomical specimens, you know, from China that somebody carried on. And so we don't, we're not going to get that person identified. So... Um, we narrowed it down to the ones that we thought we could. And then as, um, the next step was to create um, some sort of posters, and I have some of them here. And so students created this format on kind of how we could show these people and what information we had available about them. And so students took individual cases and groups, and they created posters. And so what we ended up with is um, a whole collection, a file of these posters. The good news about these posters is we could potentially use these at events. We could potentially put them out in the community. And we could also use them at what we really hope is going to happen next year, and that's going to be the Nevada Missing Persons Day. And we're going to have the police department, missing persons departments involved, NICMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, have all these agencies that deal with these you know, missing people and unidentified people. And we're going to have a day in Nevada where everybody can come together and try to share what information they have and so I envision um, these cases being used then and then we've also created a binder that has all of these as well so eventually or even at the coroner's office individual family members can sift through and see what we have at the coroner's office anything that that um, might help them um, find their loved one and so that was one big part of it um, and so we're very happy about kind of how far we got with this. We're not done. There's still cases that we can continue to do just with the time frame that we had available to us. Um, we have like little scan codes that goes back to NamUs so you can get more case information if you need to. And again, this is the finished product. And so um, this is an individual that... Um, was walking across Owens Avenue in 2019. Um, probably a transient, but we don't know that for sure. And he was struck by a car and killed. Um, this gentleman's facially recognizable, you know, and there was no reason why, if you didn't know this person, you'd be able to help us identify him. But from the coroner's office, he didn't have identification. His fingerprints didn't match any databases. And he's not in any um, CODIS. He hasn't had his DNA taken for any reason. And so he's remained a John Doe at our office. I would love to see this case get resolved. You know, somebody knows this gentleman. And that's the point of this project, is try to get these people out there so that if somebody knows who they are, we can make those connections. And that was really what I look forward to, is finding out who this person is and who the others are. Another component, um, which was kind of an added benefit of going through these cases, is we found that the coroner's office had retained tissue samples of some of these does for different reasons. And so we had students go through which cases we had tissue samples from. And that could be um, blood spot cards, which is what you see um, down there on the table. Um, but it also could be a piece of a pelvis or a uh, jawbone or a scapula or a piece of a kidney that we retain for different reasons. And so this is great, um, not because uh, to get them into CODIS for DNA comparison, but because of this new technology and technique that's out there, which is forensic genealogy, which is when we can upload a DNA profile from our unknown person and then have a, a genealogy go through and find genetic relatives and figure out who may be missing in that person's family. So this is a brand new technique. Um, we are still in the process of learning about it and just starting to kind of get some of these cases put through. But we look forward to, with these, we could have a kind of this extra benefit of running a genealogy search. And so we catalog those, we retain those, we got rid of some that weren't um, part of uh, current cases. And then we also found kind of another treasure is when we um, exhumed all those does about 10 years ago, we took samples um, from the femurs and we sent them to a lab, a forensic lab, to upload it into CODIS. Um, we didn't have a lot of success with that because CODIS is just those people that got arrested typically for a felony. And that's only in recent years, and different states have different statutes on whose DNA goes into CODIS. And so that one-to-one -one match that CODIS typically needs um, didn't have a lot of success for identifying our does, just because many of them aren't in CODIS. I'm not in CODIS either. So um, what we did find is that the, the company 
that we used to extract the DNA gave us some samples back, and we've retained those in a freezer. And so they look like this. Um, we didn't really know what they were at first, and they just have barcodes and numbers at them on them. And so we kind of sorted through them, found the company that ran this, talked to the company that did this, and they said, yeah, this is DNA extract. And this is how much DNA extract is in each one of those little tubes. And so um, we went through that and talked to forensic genealogists to see if this is enough to run genealogy. And the answer is probably. They said yes with the number, but we don't know degradation or any mixtures or anything like that. So this is a great news because almost all those ones that we exhumed that we still haven't identified, we now have a new kind of um, approach that we can do using this 21st century forensic science, using forensic genealogy. And so we have now um, kind of uh, reinvigorated, you know, a pursuit to get more of these people identified again. Again, this is not the first time, and it's not going to be the last time. Anytime we see new technology, I hope that we go back at it and try to see if we can get these um, cases resolved. And so this is from a local article in the RJ, is that we are continuing to search for these real names of our John and Jane Doe's. Again, we're not realistically going to get 270 identified, but we want to get as many as we can identified using, in part, this new kind of science of forensic genealogy. And with that, I'm going to have Maddie go and explain which, or, or explain some of the cases that we chose to do this with. All right. Microphone is working. Can you guys hear me well? Thank you. So this is one of the first cases we picked. It began in 2008 when the Henderson police received an unsigned letter with GPS coordinates um, about five miles outside of US 93 in the Boulder Highway. Of course, they had to investigate. And when they did, they found a skull. Uh, around that surrounding areas, they found other partial skeletons. And although, um, along with some articles of clothing. You can't see, but when they did the facial reconstruction, she's wearing a red flannel, which they believe belonged to the victim. Because there was just skeletal remains, they couldn't get too clear of a picture of what she looked like, but they know she had auburn hair, and they did a facial reconstruction, and this is what they believe they, she looked like. Um, they're not sure about her height or her weight, though. And can we go on to the next slide? This is another case we chose. It's right here, um, the complete picture. In 2011, there was a four-door sedan driving towards Fremont Street, and the vehicle crashed, caught on fire, and all occupants were charred. They were able to identify the driver, but unfortunately, he lied about where he was with, where he was going, and who he was with. So they were unable to identify um, the following girl. And everybody in his life that matched the description uh, was still alive, so they came to a dead end. They were able to figure out that she was a black female, about 25 to 50 years old, and they believe she was about five foot three and 165 pounds. And this is a person my group was actually able to work on. They had a little more a little more information about her. In 2011, in the Silver State Recycling Center, um, an employee found a disembodied torso in a pink suitcase. And through further search of the trash, they were able to find other limbs, including a head. It was already kind of decomposing at the time, so we weren't able to provide any photos. But we did get a clear sketch, and we know she had two piercings in her right ear and one in her left ear, and they believe she was about five foot, 200 pounds, and she was Hispanic. Sadly, even with all this information, they weren't able to identify her, but all this information is on NamUs, and all the posters have these QR codes that will bring you directly to the site. Thank you. So uh, we, we look like uh, we hope to anyhow through these various means of posters and Missing Persons Day and new technology including forensic genealogy to identify as many of these people as possible. Um, so that will conclude our presentation. I would like to thank of course the Ma Museum for inviting us and for hosting us. Um, the Clark County Coroner's Office has a new corner, Coroner Rouse, so thank her for supporting this project. Coroner Murphy is the one who approved it. Um, Coroner Feudenberg was 
hugely instrumental in creating this collaboration between Veterans Tribute and the Clark County Coroner's Office. He's the one who definitely helps with all of our internships, and that's been a huge success. Um, all of the people at the Coroner's Office who continue to work hard, and then, of course, the school for allowing students to do this, and, of course, lastly, um, the forensic science students themselves who spent so many hours working on it. So thank you all for attending, and we happy, hope you have a great rest of your day. Scott and Sarah, thank you so much, as well as Maddie. There are a few questions sure. um, that we received online, so I, I want to spend some time to get through these. Um, the first one, someone said, how does the 270 John and Jane Doe cases that Nevada has, how does that compare to other states? Is that unusual? Um, I don't have numbers for every other state. Uh, I do not think that it is unusual um, for the amount of time that we have. These cases go back since the 70s. And we only have, I think, about seven or so from this year. And many times, through our normal investigative research, uh, capabilities, we ultimately do get these people identified. So I don't think that it's an unusual number. Um, some of these, again, are just because of the types of cases they are. You know, skeletal remains um, that are out in the desert are very difficult if you don't have any identifying information. You don't have anywhere to start. You know, there's no databases to go look through. And, and also, unfortunately, just over time, sometimes, even if you have skeletal remains that are sitting out in the desert, you know, the DNA degrades. So we sometimes kind of get stuck with, with what we have. But good question. I don't think it's um, overly high or low. Okay. Another person asked, what new technology are you using with some of the unidentif unidentifiable cases? Good question. So this um, forensic genealogy um, is new in the last couple years, and it's definitely new for the Clark County Coroner's Office. We really look forward to utilizing it in addition to our previous investigative efforts. Um, it does cost money, you know, uh, which is part of the, the reality of what we deal with. And so um, we, we only have finite resources, so we have to figure out when and which cases we get to allocate that to. But I do think that forensic genealogy and this new type of, um, techno new type of um, technique, I think, will be hugely beneficial. So can I just add that real quick? So the idea that um, in the past, like Scott said, uh, DNA samples got uploaded to CODIS, and you had to have an individual in CODIS to identify that person. But there's a lot of us nowadays who are using um, databases um, and genealogy websites like 23andMe, um, like the National Geographic one. There's a, a few others out there. And so the idea is a lot of us have put our DNA on the internet and um, so that's out there. And so now if you have an unidentified person, you don't necessarily have to find that person's DNA, but you can find a relative's DNA. And so there's genealogists out there and genealogy companies that that DNA could then be compared to anybody who's put their DNA, DNA out there and um, consented to that. And then um, hopefully then identified maybe not a brother or a sister, but maybe a second cousin. And then somebody, an investigator has a place to start. That's a good point. Have you ever thought about doing a marketing campaign with the posters that the students created? And you kind of talked about that before, but if you could reiterate that. Yeah, I do hope um, that they will be able to be utilized in a kind of a public format at some point. Um, we've discussed it at the coroner's office and kind of where and how that would look. Again, without um, offending it, we, you know, I personally think that it's a, it's a, it's hugely useful and and has a huge benefit. There's others though that that you know don't want to see a picture of a deceased person on the bus stop every day that they sit at, and so we kind of have to balance those things. Um, I do think that that upcoming Nevada Missing Persons Day will be a moment when we can highlight a lot of these cases and get local news agencies involved, hopefully too. So kind of then it's in the, in the correct context as well. Thank you. Does anyone here in the room have any questions? Gotcha. And so, um, Scott, I know you brought along some items. Can you just explain what all of that is? Yeah, <laughs> sure. So it, it's just uh, kind of some of the typical um, techniques that we would use to identify people. So when we have skeletal remains or even decomposed remains that um, the individual is no longer facially recognizable, um, we'll typically go to anthropology because the anthropologist will be able to give us kind of a profile of the person. And so that profile is made by measurements of the skull that gives a kind of an estimate of ancestry or ethnicity. Um, we can look at pelvises to determine um, sex and we can look at long bones to determine height. And so that profile will allow us to kind of um, 
narrow down who that person could be. And this is beneficial, especially when comparing to missing persons reports through local police departments. Um, we also use uh, odontologists in town who is wonderful and does a um, great job um, trying to make identifications using teeth. And, and then the last one is DNA. Mm -hmm. And so although um, there's a gel electrophoresis, which is kind of an old way to do mm -hmm. it, but DNA is extremely useful as well. Um, again, the the pro and con of all of these is, you know, fingerprints, most of us as adults in the United States have our fingerprints on file somewhere. So fingerprints are kind of one of our first go-tos, and we have huge success getting people identified by fingerprints. Um, but then when we don't have fingerprints through decomposition or other losses, um, then we have to rely on some of these other tools. And um, the last one there is that DNA, which is, get, is good, especially if we have a family member to compare it to. The problem we run into if we don't have a family member to do a comparison is where we kind of run into some problems. And I'm interested here, and maybe this is a question for Maddie, but the interest, I guess, um, you know, with forensic science among young adults, too. Can you explain your experience over the past few months? Yeah, well, if I'm being totally honest, I got interested in forensic science because of all the crime shows on TV. I feel like they're a big hit, and although they're not very accurate, <laughs> uh, a lot of the times you'll see them handling things without gloves, and we actually discussed one episode in our class of Forensics Files where the investigator took a piece of hair and put it in their pocket, <laughs> which definitely doesn't happen in the real world, <laughs> but it's enough to hook the youngsters and get them into the forensics field. Mm -hmm. That's why I chose Veterans Tribute in this specific field. And I think it's also really interesting how it's not just forensic science, you know, all of the sciences kind of connect. And if you do want to go into law, you could still see the, where the evidence is coming from, how it could be used. You know, you learn about how you can actually say something is like, positively like identify that this is a match but rather um it's it's more likely to be this person like you have a percentage of how likely it is versus it's a hundred percent and i feel like it's really interesting for all of us to see how it connects to things in our day-to-day -day lives you know genetics you have like the ancestry and stuff that you just do at home with your family and then you see how it connects with forensic science and then you could see how it also has diseases and stuff so it's really it's a gateway to, for all the other fields thank you are there any other future projects that either of you are working on so I want to continue this project we didn't get through all of the cases and so I we, there's still some work to do there um, and then um, there's I think there's always a potential to to get exposure for these ones and to keep them kind of, you know, in the public's eye at whatever level that may be, just to um, try to get as many of these cases resolved as possible. So I have an interest in continuing working with our John and Jane Doe's. And then also I think that um, continuing to collaborate with our local community partners is a huge thing that our school and um, the students, I think, will hugely benefit from. So um, working with our police departments and um, district attorney's offices and fire departments, and I think that's a huge way to to keep these connections and create like I think a, a more uh, realistic and fuller educational process and also makes them set up for success in the kind of the work world so I look forward to kind of building on those relationships in, in the future years absolutely anything else that either of you want to mention Mm -mm. All set. Thank you so much, Sarah, Scott, and Maddie. This was really just an incredible presentation to learn what you all have been doing over the past few months. So much more productive than <laughs> <laughs> some of the rest of us. Um, but uh, thank you so much for the work that you're doing in the community. Thank you to those watching online, yeah. those who were able to join us in person. We really, really appreciate it. And I hope you all have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.